presentation. Uh, so good morning to all. Um, a warm welcome for this webinar on robots and unmanned vehicles to support first responder operation. Um, I think it's a pleasure for us to, to have the, this session today um, because we know that it's a hot topic. Many organizations, many projects are working to, to develop solutions. Um, we are at different stage of maturity for, for the robots and unmanned vehicles. So I think it's a, it's a good time to, to share uh, some findings and uh, solutions that have been developed. Um, so my name is Marie-Christine Bonamor from Public Safety Communication Europe. Uh, we are an, an organization based in Brussels, um, gathering uh, uh, three community together, uh, user, industry, and researchers, and working to, uh, to uh, develop or improve uh, communications among uh, responder and um, uh, civil protection organizations. And we are a partner in, in Responde. So um, I will just show briefly uh, the agenda uh, for this uh, session today. If my slide is moving. Okay. An issue with them. So you will find here um, there is a, a small change uh, in the agenda um, because the introduction uh, of Responde project will be uh, given by uh, Yazona Zenekis uh, from EUC because Mr. Boustras is busy and there is uh, in parallel uh, a general assembly of the project. So Yazona will replace him and give us uh, the presentation of Responde. Uh, then there will be uh, some uh, technical partners uh, who will present uh, the different solutions developed uh, either in Responde or in search and rescue uh, projects, and also uh, some solutions that are uh, being uh, deployed uh, nationally uh, by the German Rescue Robotic Center. So Nicola will uh, give us uh, some other view of their activity uh, in in this uh, research center. So, uh, without any further delay, I would like to give the floor to uh, Yazonas for a general introduction to the Responde project. Please, Yazonas. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I was going to participate in the webinar, but uh, due to the current uh, General Assembly, um, I'm replacing Professor Bustras, which is, uh, who is the director of uh, CERIDIS. Um, and uh, as uh, CERIDIS, uh, the research center and the European University Cyprus, we are coordinating the Respond Day project. Uh, and um, allow me to start the presentation. I just need to, uh, uh, Jean to start sharing the presentation because I don't have it here with me. Oh, great. Uh, maybe I forgot to say something about uh, the webinar. There will be time for questions after each presentation. So uh, please uh, use the chat to, to, uh, to write your question and there will be time to, uh, to answer some of these questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Marie-Christine. So uh, next slide. So um, Respond Day is a project uh, funded by the EU. It's a Horizon 2020 project under the call uh, DRS02 for Technologies for First Responders. It started in June 2020, and we are currently in the last stages of the project. Uh, the project is ending in uh, 2023, end of May 2023. And uh, as you will see in the presentation, we have uh, already covered a long way in terms of the technologies that are being uh, developed, the trainings and the pilots. Uh, the main uh, project of uh, the main aim of Respond Day is to enhance first responders efficiency and safety by enhancing situational awareness. So 
Uh, what we're doing is uh, basically boosting the using technologies and products um, uh, and uh, uh, combining them for early assessment, for safety assessment, risk mitigation capabilities, clear common operation picture and uh, optimal management of uh, operations at any scaling and complexity of disaster. As you can see, there are numerous uh, countries, partners from uh, numerous countries participating in the project and um, uh, pilots and trainings are taking place in different countries and uh, settings. Next slide. Uh, we are uh, preparing, as said earlier, products and services that are being developed in uh, uh, Respond Day and we have sorted them in uh, four different categories. Uh, augmented reality, sensors and wearables, mission critical communication technologies and robotic and uh, Alman uh, vehicles. You can find these details in our, on our website and clicking on every category you can see the products and the services that are being developed and you can uh, find more details, more specific details about the product, what they do and how they're being combined together. Um, there are, uh, there's a five tire uh, architectural structure with different layers in order to cover um, the way these technologies and processes and products are used in order to cover the uh, scenario, every scenario and every uh, operation that comes in place. We have the user interface uh, layer where we have uh, mobile apps um, uh, augmented reality for first responders. We have a uh, augmented reality interface for command and control center. We have the comprehension layer, which is um, um, command control. We have a uh, situation awareness, early uh, warning activity. We have the processing layer, uh, the data fusion and the UAV part. Basically, what uh, the data that comes in, it's uh, it's in the process stage. We have then the network layer that we are using that the uh, connectivities and the uh, technologies that are related to the network layers. So we have the 5G, the local 5G network. We have 4G, the Tetra, etc. In order to cover the communication, the networking of uh, the operational status there. And you have the perception layer where we're using cameras, the 360 views um, and the sp specific uh, sensors uh, to cover what's going on uh, on the ground. Uh, next uh, slide. Um, this, uh, the photos here are from uh, trainings that took uh, place uh, up to now. We have covered four trainings where we give the practitioners a hands-on training with the technologies and uh, solutions developed in Respond Day. Basically, we're calling in um, um, first responders to get to know our technologies. We give them the opportunity to try them on and uh, see what they can do with them and what the plan is uh, related to their development so that they get aware with uh, what uh, Respond Day is doing and uh, basically what the future is in terms of how they're operating. We have done four trainings up to now. The last one was in June 2022 in Bulgaria. And the next one is planned for February 2023 in Valencia and it's going to take place uh, during the last pilot of the project. Uh, regarding the webinars, uh, the, this is um, another one that we're attending now. You can see the previous ones. Uh, we present the, the technologies, the state of the art for the technology. We discuss the particular technologies within the Respond Day, the developments within the Respond Day. And of course, the, the main added value from these uh, webinars is that we provide the platform to discuss with other partners, with other uh, projects, and of course with the public uh, in order to know about similar uh, projects or in initiatives that are taking place. And of course, we also get to know and uh, the, we get feedback from the public and uh, from other projects and initiatives about the, pro the, the work that we are doing in Respond Day and uh, the work that others are doing in other projects and initiatives. Uh, the previous ones were about augmented reality, uh, wearables, and now today's is about uh, robotics. 
uh, the three pilots of the project uh, that uh, are uh, the first two took place in Athens in September 2022. The second one happened in uh, Cyprus in October 2022, and it was about the forest fire scenario. The pilot in Athens was about an earthquake scenario with uh, different scenarios in the operations uh, field where uh, some of the technologies, not all of the technologies, based, uh, based on the scenarios and the um, and, and, um, first responders and uh, what we wanted to showcase and test in these uh, pilots different technologies uh, participated um, and um, getting the feedback from the participants, the evaluators and the first responders. We are uh, developing and we're preparing for our last uh, pilot, uh, the major uh, pilot of the project in Valencia in 2023, uh, which is uh, taking place in uh, uh, next February in a couple of months. Next slide. So about the pilots, uh, just to go through the scenarios, uh, the last uh, uh, session, uh, we changed the dates of the first two pilots due to the fire season because we wanted to have uh, the availability of the first responders in the Cyprus pilot uh, because they were related to fire and we wanted to have the local uh, fire service and the local um, um, civil protection uh, responders and the first responders to participate in the specific uh, pilot. We had to change the date. So this is uh, time-wise, the Cyprus pilot happened second. It was about uh, a fire uh, scenario, a forest fire scenario. It happened in the fire station in Larnaca, in a new fire station with a participation and at the presence of uh, first responders and the fire service. And uh, basically, we allowed them to test the communication technologies. Um, uh, they tested the protective means of the first responders, um, uh, sensors, um, and all the technologies and products that are related to a fire event. And then we also did a, a, a rescue operation uh, in order to test uh, the drones and the sensors and that uh, everything was uh, tra to, um, moved to the command and control center. The first, uh, the first pilot happened in Greece, in Athens, last uh, September. It was an earthquake scenario and uh, we had trapped victims inside the collapsed building and the other one was a trapped uh, rescuer and a victim inside the flaming big building. So as you can understand, we used uh, the technologies and the products that are related to uh, the specific scenario. A 5G network was set up in place. The robot, uh, robot was used to enter the building and uh, cover the operations, thermal cameras, uh, sensors on the uh, rescuers, and of course the command and control center and all the uh, communications available, networking at the uh, place, at the scene. Uh, both of the pilots were a success and we got valuable feedback from uh, the participants and the, uh, and the first responders that uh, came uh, third party uh, first responders. The third one uh, that is currently being prepared is going to take place in Valencia in Spain uh, near the port, inside basically the port area. Uh, we are uh, doing uh, a rescue and maritime cleaning operation uh, and, and as you can see, we're going to use uh, the technologies of the project that have been developed up to now to establish a safety assessment and early warning framework that protects first responders. We're going to validate the ability, uh, the ability to set up the robust 5G private mobile network in the area, which was the case with the previous pilot, but uh, because this is a bigger area now, we are basically testing uh, we're doing the final testing of this uh, ability and uh, we're going to use um, third party first responders and uh, the project's first responders and partners for um, the uh, coordination and evaluation of the, uh, the pilot. You can visit our website. Uh, for all, for more details about the project and especially the training and the pilots, 
You can also find videos uh, from the trainings, from the previous webinars on our YouTube channel. Uh, and of course, uh, Twitter and LinkedIn for more information. You can see a list of the uh, partners that are taking place and everyone can offer different uh, information and more specific information if you would like more about that. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, um, I think we can do a Q&A now, Marie-Christine. Yeah, if there, if there are some questions. Uh, maybe I would just add one thing also about uh, the Responde uh, website. There is also there a detailed presentation of the different solutions mm. uh, that have been provided. So if you want to have uh, more technical details, uh, you can go through uh, the different solutions that have been developed uh, in the project. Um, but as it is an introduction, I don't know if we're going to get many questions there, maybe more after the, the presentation on the, the robots uh, and manned vehicle solutions. So uh, I think that we can go to the next presentation. Uh, it's a presentation by uh, Josh de la Portas from Probotech. How can innovative robots and unmanned vehicle enhance operational capability of first responders, the state of the art? So, uh, George, you've got a, a big question, so we are looking for answers. <laughs> the floor is yours. Hi there, this is George Laportas from Probotech. How are you? Thanks for having me in this uh, workshop. So, our, this presentation is um, a joint presentation from uh, Probotech and uh, also from um, uh, Robotnik. We are about to uh, present you uh, how the innovative UXV solutions, by UXV I mean robotics and drones, in other ways, robots on the ground and robots in the air, um, and how they can assist uh, the first responders. Um, so our title uh, is, uh, like Marine said, uh, state-of-the-art solutions using robotics and AI, of course, for smarter on-site operations. I'm moving on to the next slide. So this is our table of contents. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Probotech's uh, main solutions. Uh, we'll show you, we'll showcase you how the operations is done with UAVs and drones, about our platform, and some um, uh, insight for the AI information, and of course, a reference to Robotnik's uh, uh, drones, actually robots on the ground. And of course, we'll see by the end uh, what practical results we gain from those um, uh, technologies and how this impacts uh, fire responders um, um, assistance and fire responders uh, functionality uh, onto the on-site and the mission critical applications. So um, as Probotech, what we have um, put inside the, uh, the process and what we have introduced uh, in the uh, Respond A project is uh, our three main uh, core platforms. Um, the one is called Venus. Um, Venus is actually a common operational picture. It's actually a system a platform, an ecosystem of platforms, actually, that um, interacts with many, many applications, services, and also enables um, all participants on the field to uh, tactically organize and manage processes and also put in the process the utilization of several services and applications so that we can have a far more organized uh, way uh, to solve uh, practical solutions like informing the FRs on the field, like informing them from any threats, any conditions, any, any crazy conditions that may happen, may arise, and also uh, coordinate with other subsystems to uh, manage the drones, uh, the robots, and anything else like the sensors on the field. So for that purpose, we also have uh, built the Mission Control Center. It's part of the ecosystem that we have, uh, I have just uh, told you before. The MCC is actually an application which enables us uh, in, the, in, the control, in the control room, in the control center, to control all the robots and all the drones involved in the process so that we can assist the EFRs. And then we have Cyclops, which is actually another subsystem in the ecosystem of the, of the uh, Venus um, Operation Center that gives us the ability to have real-time AI recognition, detection, and other um, important critical information that we get, like uh, tracking uh, assets like people, hu um, humans, generally speaking, uh, or see the, the position of, um, of a fallen um, uh, 
uh, man or woman, or possibly get information regarding a rise of a um, fire or uh, smoke on the field. And that all happens in real time, and the, the people, the supervisors inside the control center can have real-time information, a real-time picture of what's happening on the field to assist, of course, the FRS. Now, um, in order to do all that, we have uh, built a system, an overall system, which is actually mostly of a cloud operational platform. We call it the Airflow. And uh, in order for you to visualize what's going on behind the scenes, as so you can understand how the Airflow is being involved in the process, I have here for you uh, a screen which showcases uh, a real life example in an industrial area. Uh, and next to that is a city and actually a park. Uh, and that could be, generally speaking, um, a miniature of what's happening in a real life in a, in a real city. So as you can see, we have drones flying around, we have satellites, so we have satellite images, pictures, um, we have uh, drones on the field, we have uh, cars, all kinds of uh, moving assets on the map. So you can imagine that airflow is like the all seeing eye over on top and watching everything that's happening so we can control and we can carefully devise our next moves by having um, uh, an operationally fully capable picture, which means that all the conditions that have to be taken care of are managed by this overall uh, system that's um, uh, managing the, um, um, the COP uh, and the MCC and all the applications that I have um, previously referred to. So uh, in a more uh, technical and more practical way, in order to do operations uh, with UAVs and drones, we have, of course, uh, to have some tools. Um, we build uh, certain tools uh, like the one you see on the right screen, um, which pretty much um, utilizes uh, the classic joystick or joypad that we all know, either from gaming or other, from other operations, like the pilots usually use this kind of uh, tools to fly their airplanes uh, or in the simulator possibly. So we integrated those uh, kind of tools uh, for our ease, of course, uh, so that we can fly either locally or remotely, because that's also another case, in case we are far away from the, from the on-site operation or the event actually happened, like the fire or the smoke. Um, we integrated, like I said before, cutting edge AI algorithms to detect people, smog, fire, and track the assets uh, while on the field. And of course, utilize the same technologies to track them also, not from the cameras of the drones, but the robots, and also from any possible CCTV cameras that are right now on the field. And um, of course, UGVs uh, can be controlled seamlessly in the same way, so that you don't have to have different operational um, architectures and different frameworks or a software to control um, two assets on the same field. Now, uh, going back to the advanced AI, uh, like I told you, Cyclops is an application. It's actually a sub uh, feature of uh, the whole operational picture. Uh, and it provides us with the ability to uh, control certain kinds of cameras. Either they are electro-optical or infrared cameras, which they can, they can see uh, through, the, through the night in the darkest, um, uh, darkest also areas. We can zoom in, zoom out, uh, control the gimbals, if a gimbal exists um, in any of our devices. And we can um, um, transmit the real-time AI information through those cameras. So pretty much any camera that exists out there in the market can be utilized by our system. And after that, we have some strong statistical information that's coming through where we can actually log the events that happened and then we can uh, propose solutions afterwards or due time while the operation is happening. Now, um, a few things about um, uh, uh, Robotnik's uh, Summit Excel robot. Um, actually, um, this is a very nice capable uh, system. Uh, it's an all-terrain uh, mobile robotic platform. It's equipped with um, a variety of sensors. Um, it has also thermal camera, uh, gas sensors for gas leaks or whatever. Uh, it also incorporates AI cameras and a 3D laser for the demapping of the area so they can it autonomously um, drive through the area and search, uh, for, uh, search for rescue operations mainly. And um, in order to enhance the, the features, we also, the robotic actually provided an autonomous navigation and teleoperation um, feature, which also is um, engaged very, very uh, much. Uh, with the MCC and the other applications that we're going to be utilizing for the COP operations. A bit more about the Summit Excel robot. Um, uh, in, during the pilots, and the Greek pilot that we have uh, run recently, uh, we have managed to have integrated control over 5G, 
So we utilize, as you can see, as you can imagine, all the 5G capabilities of the new era uh, to control the drone remotely and also control the, the UGVs remotely. So as you can see also on the right uh, screen, that's, that's me um, using the, the drones and at the same time controlling um, the, the robot uh, from uh, one screen, the, the so-called uh, common operational uh, platform or picture or screen, whatever you name it, it's the same. So uh, now going down to the practical just because the, the scope and the essence of uh, this project is uh, from the standing point of Responte is all about protecting human lives and of course protecting uh, uh, all the assets and being um, as primitive as possible during an operation. So during the Greek pilot, we practically showcased the, the following results. Uh, we integrated, um, like I said, all the UAVs and UGVs available. We integrated streams from drones and robots simultaneously, so you can have a whole picture from either from uh, the skies or from the ground. We use a common interface, what I already referred to as common operational platform, and we have um, uh, we have showed that uh, all actions and events can be controlled and monitored in the, under one screen. We have hosted third-party um, applications in the COP, uh, applications from uh, Sidroco like CV Tool. Uh, we have also hosted uh, weather reporting applications because it's essential that we know the exact um, uh, microclimate in the area, uh, especially we have strong winds or solar winds, uh, the UGV controls, of course, and among others. Uh, we have also connected uh, the overall systems with third-party APIs. That also uh, is, uh, weather reporting is also one of these uh, third-party APIs. We send data streams uh, through the DFF uh, platform, which is actually a platform uh, uh, built and introduced by Eight Bells, which enables us to share information among the entities and among the uh, beneficiaries working in the project. Uh, we send all the information, information uh, on the drone to the Maestro system, which is another COP providing information from pretty much every asset moving on the area, plus the drones, plus the, uh, the robots. And um, we, we managed to utilize the AI so that we can denote and track uh, people and other assets, and we can detect smoke and fire in the field. Now, the impact. As you understand, the overall impact of the system, and like I said before, is to protect the people and, of course, utilize those technologies to assist the EFRs on the field. So the COP, the Common Operational Platform, actually does that. We enhance the view uh, and the planning before any operation takes place or during the operation. So while you're on the point of interest in the area where the, the event has happened, we, we assist the FRs even before they go to the ground or after they are on site. Um, that's giving them a more robust um, picture and they can have uh, much better decisions. The decision-making process becomes uh, easier and um, much more certain uh, while they are operating on the field. And of course, we aggregated information that makes more sense because it comes uh, from the data views that we utilize and we used, we see from cameras or the sensors on the ground or pretty much anything, anything else that's involved. Uh, therefore, the AI uh, can detect and track people, okay, uh, much better than the, the human eye does, especially under uh, critical conditions. Uh, we have interoperation among drones and robots. Uh, we improved the, the risk management and mitigation process. And of course, we had faster and more safer processes. And we do, and we insist that we're going to have much more faster and safer process in the process if we continue utilizing the technology um, with um, um, a more operational uh, picture like the, C the COP involved here in this process. So um, what are the state of the art factors in the, in the whole idea and the whole project? Well, uh, um, first of all, the incorporation of new technologies and processes that's being involved um, and how we validated those um, uh, technologies during the POCs and the pilots. So in a more detail, in, a, in the bullets, we managed to safely and more securely manage information. We presented in more organized to decision makers. And by decision makers, I mean also the men in charge, the men and women in charge in the CNC centers, the command and control centers. We informed and we will be keep informing the FRs. We can guide them on site. Uh, we keep and we can still keeping, uh, and we kept also um, uh, back in the process, historic information that we can utilize in the future 
uh, so that we have better analytics and we can foresee in a way, we can predict in a way, uh, certain things that's going to happen from our perspective and from our um, historic events. So we showcase also how we coordinate and we orchestrate with various assets, so machines, devices, and people on the field in order to assist the first responders. And of course, the most important of all, by the end of how to lower um, the hazard and risk and narrow down critical uh, damage threats that may happen to all the people that are um, the victims or the actuators, I meaning again, meaning the DFRs during these operations. So future work, lots of work to be done here actually. Um, we can of course continue integrating and testing more devices, more tools, more technologies, more software, more applications. Um, we can have, we do want to have seamless control of drones and robots and pretty much any kind of device or any interface that will assist the FRs on the ground and us uh, behind the scenes as the control supervisors. And of course, we want to integrate um, things like smart tech state, uh, humanware devices and other applications and sensors on the bodies of those uh, first responders. Improved AI, of course, to even to much even better than before. Uh, critical events like fire bursts, smokes, or foresee, like I said before, things that the human eye can see during the process. And of course, to complete, uh, to propose a complete integrated solution that works pretty much in any case, in any market, in any kind of operation throughout uh, the world. That's pretty much from me. Thank you for leave sending me. And um, you have any uh, questions? I'll be glad to answer. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, George. There is a, a question uh, in the chat, so uh, if you want to uh, to answer yeah, it, I can read it. Open. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a question regarding the presented uh, UAS. Uh, in so it's a, it's a technical uh, question. Do you see it? Yeah, I see it. Okay. We have drones that we, we utilize in the open category. So these are the smallest ones, the smallest capable ones, where you actually need a, um, an, evalu an evaluation uh, of um, uh, according to the ty type A or type B or type C. Um, so that's pretty much what we want to do. And we don't want to use any like much higher, bigger and uh, larger drones because they also pose uh, a problem and, and a threat to human lives. Okay, thank you, thank you, George. So we can You're move. To, yeah, we can move to the next presentation. We we thank stay uh, with uh, with respond A, um, and we'll have a presentation by um, different partners in respond A on how robots on unmanned vehicles are integrated uh, integrated together uh, as part of the respond A project. So Sundaya, um, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, everyone, for having me here today. So I just stop sharing. Now. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. So I'm from Atmosphere, and I will be presenting the solutions that we currently have, how we have contributed to the Respond A project, and what impacts uh, that we have from the test that we completed. So this is just the rough overview of the topics that I will be talking about. So I will be briefly talking about uh, all of our technologies, planet, uh, the air to ground communications, just to give you a brief idea, it's, it's a communication, it's a multi-link terminal that provides uh, air to ground communications from the UAVs to the ground. And we also have the UAVs, which provide the air to ground communications. I will also briefly discuss the use case results that um, we did in the Cyprus demonstration and some impact and future work that we still have. So going a little bit further into the atmosphere solutions. So we have so far for the Respond A project, we contributed two self-built drones. And why would self-built drones? Because we decided that this provides more flexibility to mechanically integrate payload onto the UAVs, and it's a lot more easier to be able to um, customize the UAVs based on particular use cases. And we have a terminal which is called Planet, 
So Planet is flown on the UAVs and it has an integrated 5G modem uh, that's on the term that's flown on the terminal. So there's a flying 5G modem on the uh, Planet terminal. So this provides uh, multi-link connectivity. So it provides 5G, it pro provides LTE, it provides SATCOM, and also um, <clears throat> it's the UAV itself provides the radio link the control. And apart from that, we also own uh, the 5G RAN, which is the radio access network. This is the Amarisoft call box mini that you can see in the picture on the right. Yeah. And this works as a standalone 5G network. It has its own 5G core, so it, it works as like a PC on its own, and it can be integrated with external 5G cores, such as in this project, we had an integration with the 5G core that was provided by a partner called Athonet. And in other projects also, we have integrated um, the 5G radio access network with other 5G cores, so this provides a lot of flexibility and we have the capability to deploy our own local 5G network, which we did in the Cypress demonstration. So we were able to have our own local 5G network deployment where we were able to communicate using the 5G link to the drones from air to ground. Mm, yep, and moving ahead to further dive into the planet air to ground communications. So as I mentioned that Planet provides a multi-link connectivity, as of now, our terminals fly on aircrafts and they take part in scientific uh, missions. So we have a smaller uh, terminal, which is also, which is mounted on the UAVs, which we used in, the, in this Responde project. So as I mentioned earlier, it has a 5G modem, which is integrated inside the terminal and has external 5G antennas that is mounted on the UAV and it has uh, an Iridium link. So this is very useful for beyond visual line of sight command and control of the UAV. However, I will describe, I will talk about this further later on in the presentation and the radio link that I mentioned earlier, which can also, which is used for controlling the UAVs in uh, manual flight mode. And apart from that, the UAV, I mean, the planet um, software, as you can see in the image. So this is an example that is used for um, some of, it can be used for the aircrafts or it can also be used as UAV. It acts as a user interface. So it provides the map and the overall uh, waypoints of the flown UAV. So the user can actually see the flight of the UAV or if it's on an aircraft, the pilot can um, be able to deploy a flight plan and have better access to telemetry data on the user interface and also um, have real time message and chat exchange when they're on board to the ground. And going down to the UAV air to ground communications. So here I will describe a little bit more detail how the payload is connected to the planet terminal. So as you can see in the image on the onboard payload, so we had the 360 degree camera, which was also provided by uh, an external partner called ITOCAT. And this was able to provide the live video stream, providing the aerial view of the disaster zone into the command and control center. And we have a Wi-Fi access point. So the main idea of the Wi-Fi access point was to provide the local uh, bubble of connectivity to the first responders to be able to connect on the ground. And as I mentioned earlier that it, in addition to the 5G uh, modem inside the planet terminal, there were also 5G antennas that connected to the planet terminal. And we have flight controller that uh, is used for sending telemetry data to be able to load the mission plan and fly, fly the UAVs. <clears throat> and uh, additionally, the Iridium antenna is also integrated into the planet terminal. So as you can see that the planet terminal that uh, Atmosphere provides is quite customizable based on specific use case. And we customize this terminal to the specific responde use case so that we will be able to achieve and provide such kind of um, uh, such kind of features such as the camera capability, the, the Wi-Fi access availability, and also the 5G 
connectivity, which is very important to fly the drones and to demonstrate it in this um, Cyprus use case, because in Cyprus or in such kind of disaster zones, cellular connectivity is very scarce and it's quite difficult to have a very reliable connection. So being able to dis demonstrate using the flight of the UAVs, having the LTE connectivity was quite important. And on the ground, you can see that uh, the Wi-Fi was made available for the first responders that connected to the Wi-Fi access point, which was flying on the drone. And <clears throat> we had deployed a local 5G base station using the integration of the 5G RAN and the 5G core that I earlier spoke about. And this was able to send the um, telemetry data, mission data, and the video stream through the gateway that we already had on the ground. So all of the message exchange, the video stream, and telemetry data was being sent through the planet terminal from onboard the UAV to the ground in the command and control center. And the telemetry data and the live video stream was displayed in the command and control center. So the first responders could be able to, they had access to the live video stream and have aerial view of the, uh, of the disaster zone. And the telemetry data was very helpful in providing disaster localization, providing the live coordinates of uh, the disaster zone. And here, this is the Cyprus use case scenario. So just to uh, go a little bit more into uh, talking about our technologies and uh, what happened in Cyprus. So the fire service is very, it's highly uh, dependent on the cellular network and ultra high frequency radio links during emergency and rescue missions. So for this reason, the use of the UAVs played a very useful and important role. That's the reason why I mentioned that it was very important for us to demonstrate the LTE uh, capability of the UAVs in Cyprus. Um, as this is very keen, demonstrating having a very high and reliable cellular connectivity during a simulated forest fire scenario. So this is what happened. In Cyprus, we had a simulated forest fire scenario uh, where the first responders um, are able to have um, you know, live uh, location of the disaster zone and also have live video stream using the UAVs. So how this actually worked in the forest fire simulation is where there is an emergency call that comes into the command and control center. The UAVs are deployed. 5G network was already established uh, beforehand. And when the UAVs are deployed, they fly over the disaster zone, as you can see in the image over here, where the UAV is uh, flying above and taking a video of the fire zone. So there was a very small fire that was simulated during the scenario. As it was a fire station, they didn't want to demonstrate a very big fire, of course. And the UAV was flying over the fire, providing both the live location, um, the live coordinates, and also the aerial view in the camera into the command and control center, which was displayed on a big screen. And how that was done, I will describe in the next slides. So when it comes to the practical results, so this was uh, very important uh, for us to demonstrate to the fire service uh, and also get some feedback from them about the use case and how it was really useful for them. So the, as I mentioned earlier, the, in Cyprus, the use case was based on a simulation of a forest fire and how the application of the UAVs helped to improve the reaction time for first responders with the help of real-time data exchange, such as live video of the disaster zone, live coordinates of the UAVs to locate the disaster zone. And the fact that the UAVs were equipped with the 360-degree camera, and not only the 360 camera, but in other cases, uh, it's possible that the, this, or the UAVs that Atmosphere provides can be integrated with different other kind of cameras also. Uh, and yeah, with the 5G, uh, the planet terminal Wi-Fi access point, it was able, we were able to achieve three key points, which was being able to provide the live video stream, um, the telemetry data transmission 
to the command and control center, which was also really important. And additionally, the Wi-Fi capability that is provided from the drone. The local 5G network deployment on site, it was quite successful. We were able to provide sufficient bandwidth to allow data exchange from the UAVs. The remote radio head that you can see in the image uh, below. So this was the 5G antenna that was mounted outside. So it's, it's quite a big antenna and it's uh, designed for um, mounting outside. And this was uh, very helpful in improving the uh, 5G range. So the range can be about a few hundred meters, providing 100 Mbps of bandwidth, depending on the characteristics of the area and the 5G signal. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite good when it provides the 5G um, bandwidth and the range that it covers. So that was very useful that we were able to see and also show to the department of the fire station over there. And, and yeah, we were able, to, the fire service also was quite impressed to be able to see the reliability in the 5G connectivity between the onboard UAV, between the payload from onboard the UAV and to the ground. And as you can see on the image above that uh, there was a, a small map where we're able to send the data from the uh, planet terminal in the, directly to the DFF platform, which is provided by 8 George already mentioned that earlier. So the data exchange was able to happen between and to the command and control center from the UAVs directly, and it was displayed on the COP uh, over there and on a big screen, so where the firefighters or first responders are able to visualize the live location of the UAVs very clearly. Further, so the impact. How did how did our technologies actually make a difference uh, during this uh, fire scenario demonstration? So the planet air to ground communication it provides like the three key important things that, as I mentioned, which is a disaster localization. So how does disaster localization help or improve or affect the first responders. They're able to react faster if they're able to get the localization of the life coordinates of the, of the disaster zone, they're able to plan and react um, accordingly in time. Uh, because most of the times right now, the biggest challenges that first responders are having currently is uh, that they have um, not very reliable connectivity in areas where cellular coverage is not very good. So the reaction time is actually not as high as it should be. And sometimes it's a little bit late to be able to reach the disaster zone and the forest fire has like, you know, increased quite a lot. So it's a little bit challenging for them. So with such technologies and integration of technologies with other partners, we're able to provide uh, the live coordinates of the disaster zone through the telemetry data exchange from the UAV to the command and control center and live video stream from on board the camera. And also we're able to do the command and control for UAVs and additionally having the local uh, Wi-Fi capability from the, from the UAV. So the force responders on ground are able to connect to the uh, Wi-Fi that the UAV provides to be able to exchange images or chat messages directly to the command and control center. And yeah, so well, the Wi-Fi signal, uh, it's actually quite quite reliable, uh, what we tested in Cyprus. And however, we still have quite a lot to still work on. So that's the reason why I talk a bit more about future work. So with some of the future work, we're planning to still test further command and control of the swarm of drones. As I mentioned earlier, that Atmosphere provided, provides the two octocopters um, in the Responde project. So where one UAV is um, the backup. So in this case, we plan to fly two UAVs at the same time and be able to control them. And this is something that we still have to work on. And also we're planning to investigate the areas of um, going further into the research and cell on wings technology. So as uh, we, as I described earlier, that the 5G network deployment was uh, done on ground in the command and control center. So it was more using the concept of cell on wheels technology 
and salon wings is actually quite well, i think it still has uh, you know some years to develop because having a 5g ran to be able to be on sm a small to be mounted on a uav will still take some time and of course we have a lot of testing and integration to to still do with a lot more sensors to be able to finally say that the planet terminal is very much customizable and can be adapted to any use case. And finally, we do plan to do the uh, to test with the BV loss using LTE. So this is beyond visual line of sight because this is a point right now in the current UAV industry that a lot of a lot of people are still researching and trying to find out how they can uh, be able to come and control the UAVs where they're not really able to see it. And beyond visual line of sight, you do not have access to the radio link and you're only relying on LTE or SATCOM links in this case. So, yeah, that would be it from my side. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Sudaria, for your presentation. Uh, that was very clear. Um, I don't know if there are uh, any questions from the audience. Because I have one or two for you. <laughs> okay, sure. I get to yes. have the slides. I can yeah. maybe go back to the some of them. No, but it's it's very practical question from the side of the of the first responders. So uh, first, because you insisted on a lot about the LTE connectivity, uh, I wanted to you to uh, to explain a bit how easy was it to establish uh, the connectivity for the first responders on site of a disaster how long does it take and is it easy to uh, to deploy and the other questions because there is a uh, something that come regularly with sometimes a difficulty to use uh, uavs uh, during bad weather conditions uh, so what are the restriction or do you have any restriction when there is for example during fire if there is a a strong wind or uh, heat. Um, so that is the two questions I have about the, the usage. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. So when it comes to the 5G deployment, well, I would say that if you're going back to some of the slides before. Okay. Yeah, so in, here you can see that in the 5G deployment that we had, this was only the outdoor uh, setup that we had of the 5G antenna. So it's a very long fiber cable that is deployed um, on the, from outside to the inside of the command and control center and how long it took for us because we're also not you know doing the 5g network deployment on a day-to-day -day basis so it, it took us about like i mean roughly an hour or two to be able to do that so the idea is to connect the remote radio head from the outside to the inside to the 5g ran that I here. Yeah, this is the radio access network. So this was connected directly to uh, the 5G core provided by the external partner and the remote radio heads connected to this uh, this radio access network. So it's like a PC, standalone PC on its own that has this 5G capability. And deploying it is also, it's not really much of a challenge. However, we're only working on this band called the N40. So it's um, more of, so it, it doesn't interfere with the industrial bands. So we didn't have any issues with the 5G connectivity. However, it does have, um, if, if someone with a mobile 5G mobile needs to connect to this network that we deployed, it would not be possible because the 5G, the 5G mobiles work on a completely different band and we would need to be able to get some permission from the local cellular providers to be able to switch the bands and, you know, for the first responders or the people on site to be able to connect to the, to the, to the band that we are deploying or on site. And answering the next question of yours is about flying the UAVs um, in, in, in bad conditions. Well, our UAVs already have some capacity to be able to fly in bad conditions. However, if it's raining quite a lot, it would not be able to fly the maximum capacity that it can fly with the, probably with the winds. If, 
if the rain is quite high, then it would not be able to fly. But uh, the maximum wind speed, it would be about, uh, uh, let's say, five, five meters per second, something about this range. So it, it's something that we are still testing uh, when it comes to this, the maximum speed. Uh, wind speed that the UAVs are able to withstand is something that we still need to test further and find out because luckily during the demonstration that we had in the Cyprus um, in the Cyprus demonstration, there was not such bad weather. However, it did rain on one of the days, which is quite unexpected for Cyprus. But this is something we're still testing and it's part of the future work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sudaria. I see that there is also uh, a question in the chat that is also relating uh, to the connectivity. Um, yeah, sure. So, yes, what is your experience with the maximum data rate? How real time is real time in which video quality? And uh, do you have experience with connectivity and barriers such as mountains and canyons, for example? OK, I will start answering the, the last question. So we don't really have experience connectivity with the mountains and uh, such kind of uh, regions because we have never really tested that out. However, that's quite interesting and something that we can consider to test out further. Uh, we don't have experience yet, but we, we might plan to do that later on. And could you please go back to the first and the second questions? Yes. So the, the first question was, what is your experience with the maximum data rate uh, transmission? So how real time is real time, <laughs> in fact, uh -huh. okay. in which video quality? Yeah. Well, with the video quality, since this is not really part of uh, us, part of our technology, this was an external partner. So let's say that through the 5G network, they were, they were having like a delay of about two to three seconds. And with other data transmission, we have, uh, I think, a delay of about like one second or something like that. And the maximum bandwidth, as I mentioned, is that it's able to provide is about 100 Mbps. Okay. But again, but like I mentioned, that it also depends on the area where we deploy the 5G network because sometimes yeah. it might interfere with industrial bands. So this can be something, a, a factor that affects. Yeah. Yeah, but thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, and uh, compliment also from uh, the, the person who presented um, the question. Say that uh, the opportunity provided uh, regarding communication are quite amazing. Um, so, thank you. Well done in responding. Uh, yeah, now you. we can move to the to the next speaker. Uh, it's uh, it's. Uh, uh, Nicola Rupp from the German Rescue Robotics Center, and uh, she will present uh, her research meets deployment, and um, she will uh, give us concrete example of, of showing us what they are doing there. So, Nicola, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? My check. Yes. I don't know. Will you start the presentation or shall I? As you want, you can share directly on the and manage your presentation. Sure, I can do that. Two if it's more convenient for you, yeah. as you want. And let me then start it from the beginning. So you should be able to see it now. If not, it's like not me. full screen. It's not full screen. Oh, I see my mistake. Yeah, I am sharing the wrong. <laughs> but if you prefer, we can do it as you want. Maybe that's easier because I'm yeah. not familiar yeah. with WebEx and now I don't know how to get back from this. No, so no problem. Take no over, problem, Nicola. Awesome. Uh, Jean, can you, can you manage? Again, please put it full screen. I think it's yeah. perfect. Thank you so much. You're saving me. No problem. All right. So thank you very much for having me. I have the honor to present the Rescue Robotics Center and to talk a bit about research meets deployment. So if you can go to the next slide. I don't know. Yes. Yes. All right. So just a little bit about my background. I'm actually um, 
Um, so I will be talking about research needs deployment, our rescue robotics center, the DRZ, and the robotics task force. And just to give you a bit of background about myself on the next slide, um, I'm a voluntary firefighter myself. So I, we have in Germany this youth organization. So I joined there when I was 10. I'm a lifeguard with the LRG in Germany. I have a master of science in mechanical engineering. I'm in the research scope for seven years now. And I learned this nice word from someone from the Bavarian Red Cross. So I can consider myself a pracademic, somewhere between practitioner and academic. And I would like to start my presentation with just a small like image teaser video. If this, if this will work, we will see if you can share it. Maybe it's not working. Maybe you have to say enable editing right. Otherwise we would just move on. Yeah, it doesn't seem to work. So maybe we just skip that and go directly to the next slide. So thank you very much. I'd like to share our vision with you, which is creating civil protection solutions for tomorrow and getting them into practice. So you see how this, this ladder improved over the, the, the years and that it got bigger as the houses got bigger, but it got also equipped with more technology. And we are trying to be on the very far side of the spectrum where you see the drone, which can support because it can have a thermal camera, for example. And also we would like to incorporate um, some more robots and unmanned vehicles as the Respond A is also showing. And if you go one slide further, I would really just like to have a quick view on our vision, which is to break new ground in protecting and saving lives through helping robots. And we have a unique network of practitioners, research and industry that creates innovative technologies which should be tailored to the needs of the, um, the people who will be deploying them. And the basis of our success is in bundling these competences and the will to create something outstanding. That's what we aim to do. So if you go to the next slide, this is our areas of expertise. So we do needs assessment. We do a lot of research and development. And the aim is, as I said, to, uh, to, to have this application to practice. We are in uh, several research projects on the national level, also on European level in January starting. We are very excited about that. Then in this talk, I will give a bit of background or more about the robotics task force. I will take you to our living lab, which is based in Dortmund, Germany. We have an academy, so we provide courses and training opportunities. We will be going into certification standardization and, of course, community and public relations is also part of our mission. So if you go to the next slide, uh, let me take you to our playground, as I like to call it. So we have in all in all 2,800 square meters of a living lab where we can uh, test different kinds of things. So we have um, a lot of indoor test capability. We have Europe's largest motion capture system, so we can assess the movement of the robots, the drones, or even the personnel really, really exactly. We have the NIST lanes, which most of you might be familiar with, which are for testing ground vehicles. We have a UAV procure, just to mention a few things inside. And also outdoors, we have a large test capability. We have this earthquake scenario, which you are seeing there. And currently we are uh, building up a simulator for forest fire, like it's, it's a gas burning system. And we are building our water pool, which will have a counter current system. So you will have this water flow, uh, which you can control. And there will also be an underwater motion capture system. So in Dortmund, if you ever come to us, uh, you can test all kinds of unmanned vehicles and robots. And then I'd change and uh, dive into our robotics task force. And what you see here is our robotic command vehicle, which is at the heart of our task force. We um, developed this during a project that was funded by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And it's uh, able to bring one of our ground robots to the scene. So it's capable of having it. Then you see different kinds of antenna. As we have heard before, communication is very critical. And inside you have these um, places where the, the people who will be operating the robots or the drones will be sitting and they can uh, deploy and uh, control and give back the data. So you see on the left-hand side, one of our firefighters who had been part of this uh, training 
and he really enjoyed to have the, like this overview a drone can give you or the specific insights that the um, ground vehicle could give him. And this is also the very heart, if you go one slide further. So the, the core of our uh, robotics task force is to have these um, intersect between the firefighters and the specialists, the researchers, which are working together. So currently, as of today, uh, we have a strong cooperation with the fire department in Dortmund, especially their telecommunications platoon. So all the people in uniform are part of the fire department. And you see some civilians there, and you might wonder, so what are civilians doing at the a, at a incident scene? But these would be our sp specialists in robotics. So they will be deploying the, the robot. You see it in red. This is uh, Tim, our tail-operated one. And um, so we have this, this intersection because these robots are rather specific technology. And if you're a firefighter, you know that you already have to learn a lot. So um, it's quite nice to have some specialists coming in. And our vision would be to have several federal units. In Germany, we have this um, with CBRNE. So we have several federal units for these kind of things where also the specialists come in and help. And we would like to bring various robotic capabilities, groundwater, air, to support firefighter rescue personnel, the THW, if you're familiar with Germany, we have that, and the police also in specific situations, for example, CBRNE. So the main aim is to send robots and drones to the places where human beings maybe shouldn't be going. And then if we go further, I would take you to our deployments. I mean, we are still very young, so we have three deployments where we have supported so far. One of them was Berlin, where there was a big fire and the building was not safe anymore. It could collapse, so nobody was allowed to go in. So one of our specialists was able to fly a drone. And the way he did it was the only one window was open in the, in the roof. So he could fly one drone inside through this window, but then how would he fly the drone? Because he couldn't see it anymore. So he had a second drone, which would uh, have a 360 degree camera going through those this same window. So through this drone, through the camera, he could fly the other drone. And that's really where we have our specialists that are able to do very cool stuff. <laughs> um, kind of same in, in Essen, where we also had a very big fire. You see the, the pictures down below. It was a rather big building and it burned down really, really quickly, which it shouldn't be doing because there are building regulations that shouldn't be happening. So of course the police was also intrigued to find out what was happening. Also, it was not safe anymore to go in there. So we had the ground vehicle going in there he is very small, our Tim, so he could go there. He can climb stairs, which is very nice. And also, um, our specialist flew with a, with a drone inside, which was very exciting and interesting to be able to do that. And what you see on the right-hand side um, are some pictures where we were deployed to Erftstadt. We had a very big flood in Germany in 2021. And um, if we go one slide further, I can show also some of those pictures. I guess most of you, if you're in the session, you're familiar with that. So every blue dot would be one picture that the drone has been taken and all of them get this combined view and you have a map overlay with like Google Maps, for example, so that you can orient yourself because after a flooding or an earthquake, every large incident, nothing seems to be where it has been before. So this is quite helpful. And if you go one slide further, just to show some of the capabilities, um, this would be the elevation map. So you can see where the water is still very deep, where it's not that deep anymore. If you go one slide further, I think I also have the third one. Yeah, and you can also have this 3D model, which uh, was something that the people at the incident scene, so the firefighters in the command and control, they really, really found this very helpful to have the possibility to get into, like, as you see this view, a human being couldn't go there. So this is a perspective that usually is not, just not uh, available. And uh, we got a very, very positive feedback from this deployment where they really said like, um, this is helpful to us. Um, let's have more of that. <laughs> and I guess this is also what Respond A is doing. And uh, yeah, let's just, create a better future together. And this was just a small um, insight into what we are doing. So if you go to the last slide. Oh, 
uh, sorry, I forgot I had that in there. <laughs> we also had a, an, uh, a trial where we were looking at fire. So we had seen that before that a drone is able to be also very helpful with fire. So we were allowed to do real fire to have something burning with the fire department of Fielsen. And if you go one slide further, the aim was to check with the drones whether the drone would be able to see if there's still fire or not. So on the next slide, you will see that while to the human eye, um, it's still just like a black dot, the drone can see that there's no fire anymore. So on the left-hand side, everything is in a, in a green box. So it sees that there's fire. And on the right-hand side where the fire truck, which is labeled pink, was starting to put out the fire, while for the human eye, this is still kind of the same black spot, the drone and the co convolution and the neural network was able to detect like there's fire and there's no fire anymore. So this is also something we are looking into. How can AI support? How can we have all, all of the movements more, more autonomous? And yeah, this is where research meets deployment. So we have a lot of research capability. We are honored to have this strong connection to the fire department where we get a direct feedback. So which is working, which is not working and what do they need? And we are very happy and also happy to connect to you, to do some research with some of you if you're interested or if you want to come over Dortmund. We have, as I said, and presented quite some space and some opportunities to have very nice tests. And again, thanks so much for having me. And all the best to respond A. I'm really honored to be here and it's a very, very interesting project. Uh, thank you, Nicola. There is already one question for you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I see. The question is, in the beginning, uh, you mentioned standardization and certification that this was addressed. So what do you cover in this context? Yes, thank, thank you, you so much for, for the question. So what we are doing right now is that we also work on, um, it's like a Zen workshop agreement, but on the German level. So it's um, it's a Dean spec, this is what it's called. So this is part of the standardization activity we are currently doing. Of course, as we are assessing the needs and try to find out what is needed, we will push forward to have more standardization in different areas. Also, I think in the communication area, because in our deployment, we saw that this is quite needed. And in the certification, we are um, working on getting, um, it's also very German, I think. It's very, um, it's called DAX, so that we would be certified to be allowed to certify other things so that we could like give a stamp of approval, if you want to call it like that, to say this piece of technology is able to be doing X, Y, Z. So this is something we are still very, in our baby steps, but this is our aim and goal. Uh, I think that Sophia maybe uh, has also a question, um, but I do not see. No, no, uh, sorry, it was just um, a clarification on who is going to take uh, the floor and uh, ah. present first. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, okay, so, sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, then, uh, Nicola, I have also one question because you mentioned all the activities that you have in research and the testing things. So how do you see the solution with um, an end product? Um, so will you have your, your product that could be uh, purchased by the different fire uh, brigades in Germany? Or how do you... Do you see that? Do you see the, the evolution? Or is it going to another entity that, that will work more on um, the deployment of this product? Yeah, so the way uh, we are set up, so we started ourselves as being a research project, but the aim of that research project was to, in fact, create a center for robotics in Germany. So the way we did that is that um, an NGO was created, which was just like the natural way in German legal system to do this. It's an EV, if you're familiar with German legal system. So this is the entity that will 
be there even after all the research projects and will be doing more research projects on its own. So the testing capability will still be there. We ourselves, we are not, not building robots. Um, the way we are acting in the research project is that we have the off-the-shelf technology and we enhance it with different technologies and we see what is needed. So currently we are just having very, very different kinds of robots and uh, aerial vehicles to just see what can do what kind of job. And the integration into the fire department will also be a long-term um, partnership. So the, the car that was created in one of the research projects, which was funded by the federal ministry, it will still be with the firefighters. So the partnership is ongoing and they can still use it and they use it on an everyday basis. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, so I think that we can move to uh, the next presentation. It's um, um, from certain rescue project partners about the, the use of semi-autonomous mobile robots with innovative chemical tracing technologies as information provider in certain rescue operations. So Sophia and Nicholas, uh, I hope that <laughs> you know who will start the presentation and uh, and I give uh, the floor to, to you. Yes. Uh, yes, hello everybody. So um, I'm currently, I hope, sharing the screen. I'm not sure if it, um, if it passed through, but yeah, I will be... we can see it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I will be holding this uh, presentation with Sophia together. We are from the, we are representing the EU search and rescue project which from I understood is actually very similar to Respond A because the focus of the project is also developing and testing various technologies for search and rescue operations, for example, like wearables and robots and also combining them together in a framework to be able to visualize um, everything together. Um, so in that sense, it's very similar. It's also funded by the um, by the um, EU Horizon um, grant agreement uh, 2020. So um, in that sense, it, it kind of relates together. And in this project, we had uh, in total seven use cases hmm, of which at least they were planned in the way they are presented here. Of course, there were some minor changes that we had to kind of um, conduct to actually test it. For example, we aren't really able to create a fire inside a inside a forest so we had to draw it out and we also had um, a minor changes to the earth earthquake scenario which i will show shortly and other than that the um, technologies that we will present here uh, are focused on the three use cases marked in red which are um, basically the ones uh, either where we either use the robot or the chemical tracing device and uh, so, yeah, the, um, the general use cases for the robots, I think, were already presented by, by the, all the other presenters before us. Um, so I can uh, focus a bit more on the robots that um, the DFKI uh, kind of provides. Uh, Nicolas, yes. there is an issue because your slides are not moving. So we are still on the, yes. Yeah, I guess it's an issue if I do it full screen. So I'm just going to present it this way. Right. I guess, um, yeah, so the robots that we used in this um, in, in this project, or at least the one that we planned is the one that we, you can see on the left, which is um, on the Coyote 3. Um, it is very well suited for search and rescue applications because it can climb um, rocks or basically rubble from collapsed buildings, for example. It can also climb stairs inside buildings to maybe move up and down. Um, so this is uh, this is the robot that we originally planned for the project, but um, to adapt to the technologies that we additionally have in the project, um, which is mainly the um, uh, gas tracing device developed by the NTUA, we used the robot that you can see on the right, uh, which is not originally intended for search and rescue, but we kind of made it work. So it's a, it's a robot that provides a, a bit of mobility for various terrains, and it has a lot of sensor capabilities with various LiDAR detectors and cameras. Both robots are mainly developed by the Robotics Innovation Center, uh, which is a branch from the DFKI in Bremen. And um, I personally am working at the um, plant-based robotics uh, department, which is located in Osnabrück. 
uh, and we develop mostly the AI interfaces, for example, um, um, what an issue in search and rescue in general is that um, scenes or in general, um, the environments are very difficult or unpredictable because well, if we would be able to predict it, then um, we wouldn't have the disasters. So to be able to apply artificial intelligence inside the um, inside search and rescue, we kind of developed a simulation environment where we can simulate, for example, earthquakes and um, uh, and uh, fire, <clears throat> where we can uh, show that um, buildings can collapse and create rubble and have victims trapped underneath. And overall, what we can do inside the simulation is provide the context for the robot to apply artificial intelligence. Um, for example, we can, uh, in this case, we can just create a show this zone or create a zone where the robot has to perform a certain task. And this task can be, for example, just exploring the area, creating a map, <clears throat> or it could also be uh, finding people, for example, by rewarding the robot for, for doing that. And um, this, uh, this is allowed by the simulation. And we are hoping like if we extend it, that we get a lot more out of it and be able to apply artificial intelligence for robots. So um, for our use case um, in Austria, which was the first one with, that, uh, where we used the robot, we had a building. Um, it was um, it was kind of um, uh, set up in um, Fire Academy, where they are uh, doing uh, tests with uh, with the fire department. And uh, we, had a, we had this building where the building was uh, flooded with uh, explosive gas. And our task was to, um, uh, um, to move in the robot and detect some obstacles, detect hazards, and um, in the end, find the gas leaks. And while doing so, creating a map for the, um, of the environment for the firefighters so they know how it looks like inside and potentially also detect um, um, maybe people or um, other relevant obstacles in there. Um, and what we noticed after this uh, this use case that um, the gas sensor that we used, which was like a small handheld device for, for firefighters that they usually just clip onto their clothes, um, it wasn't enough to find um, the gas leaks because it simply wasn't um, very, um, yeah, it, it didn't provide very detailed information. So um, the kind of idea that we also had in this uh, in this project in general is to develop a more sophisticated tracing device for um, chemical compounds. And this is where I uh, give the floor to Sophia so she can present uh, this technology. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicolas, and uh, thank you all uh, and for the invitation today. Uh, so yes, um, I represent the National Technical University of Athens. I work for the um, uh, university and uh, the School of Chemical Engineering. So our uh, goal inside this project was um, to adjust the state-of-the-art uh, analytical technology, which is um, a mass spectrometric based uh, technology. It is called uh, membrane inlet mass spectrometry uh, to the needs of uh, the first responders. So we had the specific um, uh, key performance indicators at the early beginning of the project set by the, the end users and the, the requirements in the field uh, in order to provide um, uh, an additional tool uh, for uh, their um, uh, search and rescue operations in terms of uh, detecting uh, compounds that uh, could be related either to a toxic environment, which is the case of uh, uh, the forest fire scenario uh, that I will present you in a while, and also uh, for the first time to use this innovative uh, technology uh, for uh, um, detecting uh, uh, human traces, as we say. Um, uh, this is um, compounds that uh, can be found in the exhaled air of, of uh, human beings, and uh, according to the literature, um, uh, these type of compounds uh, can be uh, correlated uh, with uh, the uh, remaining uh, under the debris. So after accumulation of these compounds under the debris, uh, we could uh, um, identify 
these specific uh, volatiles. You can see here um, a photo of uh, uh, the relevant use case. Uh, it was a use case five that uh, uh, took place uh, in Limoges, uh, France, at the, a place called uh, La Souterraine. It's uh, the training field of uh, Pui uh, rescuers, uh, who were uh, the use case leaders. And we had the chance uh, to, to test uh, this device. Here you can see uh, um, a volunteer, a rescuer by Pui team, uh, role playing the victim. And uh, our device um, with the probe penetrating the, the rubbles for identifying, for identifying uh, such uh, uh, compounds. Of course, uh, the alarms of uh, uh, these uh, human uh, traces have been uh, transferred to uh, the Concord platform, which is uh, the emergency management system of uh, the search and rescue project for all the use cases. And uh, this was um, very important uh, for um, the decision makers that were uh, at the um, uh, control room uh, that uh, it was uh, settled uh, in a distance from uh, uh, the, um, the collapsed structure. Um, so in the next uh, slide, um, you can see uh, an application, another application. We had uh, two um, goals. The first one was to test uh, the rescue memes, as we called it, uh, for um, identifying um, human signs under rubble. And I have to, to say, because I forgot, sorry, uh, that um, this cannot be done with uh, the conventional uh, sensors because uh, they cannot um, uh, reach very low uh, concentrations as they are um, the compounds under the debris. So it is very difficult to, to choose another technology other than a, a very sensitive one like uh, the mass uh, spectrometer to identify such type of compounds. Uh, so another um, goal was uh, to test uh, the rescue means as an early warning system on board the robotic platforms. And uh, we had the chance to cooperate with the DEFKI colleagues for this. Uh, we had uh, integrated uh, uh, our device on uh, uh, this uh, robot that uh, you see in the picture. Um, we had um, uh, prepared some testing uh, at the Hellenic Fire Academy with the contribution of uh, EPAIPS, uh, uh, who were uh, the leaders of uh, use case four. And um, uh, here you can see the system together with the probe uh, that um, uh, is approaching uh, a forest fuel bed because uh, a prescribed burning uh, took place in order to simulate um, a forest fire uh, scenario that uh, threatened industrial uh, zone. And uh, here um, uh, you can see a video from this uh, use case, uh, uh, as I said, uh, EPAIPS uh, uh, were uh, the leaders of uh, this use case. And um, as you can see also, the robot is approaching and uh, is taking measurements online in the area where um, uh, the, the firefighters, the first responders were, in order to uh, provide with early warning alarms in terms of a toxic environment. And uh, I have to say here that um, the alarm that uh, was uh, appeared in the Concord platform again was a high uh, concentration of carbon uh, monoxide, uh, which uh, was expected since um, uh, this is uh, a smoldering fire, it is uh, smoke produced, uh, but of course everybody uh, were uh, the respective personal protective uh, equipment for the needs of the demonstration. Um, I have, before I close, I have to say that uh, the search and rescue project, of course, includes a lot of uh, other uh, technologies, but uh, it was not the case for this uh, webinar to present. We have uh, uh, focused with Nicholas only to uh, the UGVs and uh, the, the chemical uh, device for, for FENDUA. And uh, I have also to, to say that there is one more use case to go uh, in um, December, December. Um, the leader is uh, 
uh, ESDP and uh, Suma from uh, uh, Spain. And uh, we're gonna um, conduct uh, experiments uh, that has to do with um, uh, have to do with uh, an earthquake and chemical spill scenario, uh, and a small scale experiment uh, with canines. Uh, we uh, we are going to uh, produce uh, chemical mixtures, synthetic chemical mixtures that resemble uh, human odor, and we are going to hide this type of uh, of uh, chemical mixtures uh, in the rubbles and uh, record the responses of uh, uh, the canines uh, for testing these uh, uh, synthetic uh, uh, mixtures of uh, human presence and uh, compared with uh, what we have the, uh, found in uh, use case five with uh, the rescue memes. So this is it. Thank you very much. And uh, we're here for any questions. Thank you, the two of you, for the presentation. There is one question already on the chat. Okay. Uh, I think it's uh, maybe more question to, to Nicolas. Um, how heavy is the MIMS? Could it be mounted on UAVs? Uh, maybe I have to, to answer yes. this. Yes, yeah. go, go uh, Okay. The memes, I have to say, it is a prototype. Uh, it is not, um, and the, the, the challenge was, as I said, uh, at first place, to adjust uh, this uh, type of technology to the specific needs of the search and rescue, of course. The search and rescue needs are very demanding and different uh, in its uh, use case. Uh, the uh, weight of, uh, of uh, our devices um, um, cannot um, allow uh, to use it with a conventional uh, UAV, but we could be used uh, with a TANAN, for example. Uh, in the next uh, um, uh, period and uh, after uh, the, the end of uh, the search and rescue project, uh, our goal is uh, to make it a little bit uh, um, lighter uh, in order to have uh, more um, uh, flexibility in choosing uh, different uh, robotic platforms for uh, um, adjusting it as uh, a roving system or on board, uh, possibly on uh, UAVs. Thank you for, uh, for this answer. Uh, is there any other questions? I do not see any other question. Um, so thank you. And uh, we can move to the next speaker, uh, another uh, Nicolas uh, Vretos from CERT. Uh, representing the project Intrepid on symbiotic robots for first responder. So, Nicholas, the, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. I'm just trying to find and share my screen for you. So, uh, just tell me if you can see my screen. Yes, that is perfect. Okay, that's good. So, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicholas Vertus. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm a bit feverish today, so my voice, it's, uh, it sounds weird, so excuse me about that. So, um, today we're going to introduce you uh, a bit uh, on the Intrepid project, and also we're going to talk about how symbiotic agents can assist uh, first responders to do better what they're doing best. So, uh, Intrepid aims to uh, revolutionize first responder operations and uh, the overall idea is to enhance the speed range and effectiveness of the first responders uh, to do so uh, we have two things in mind mainly um, assessment of the area and safe exploration so what we build is based on these um, uh, objectives so uh, Intrepid, it's, it's a concrete system architecture with backend module services, advanced networking, mobile system, and also um, different cyber physical agents. Uh, a concrete market orientation, uh, open uh, to affordable technology, and um, also secure uh, and integrated platform, because Intrepid is, is a whole, so this is um, good for um, a marketed solution. And then 
uh, we validate and test our solution in different and gradually more difficult actually um, uh, simulations, starting from um, a major natural disaster, passing to industrial accident, and then to man-made incidents to cover also for terrorism and uh, alike. Well, uh, right now we are in year three, actually starting year three. Uh, we just finished our second pilot in Marseille and uh, we already have our phase two evaluation um, right now. So we already deployed our tools uh, of the beta release and uh, um, actually um, we are still evaluating the results of this pilot that happened in, um, in the beginning of uh, November. So we already have tested in Stockholm Metro where the natural disaster was actually flowed. And then uh, the second pilot was in Marseille, as I uh, explained earlier, with uh, chemical hazards and also other um, industrial accidents. And then the third and last pilot will happen in um, a Madrid hospital, which will simulate a large explosion uh, after man-made event. Uh, so. The Intrepid project is uh, mainly um, a tactical communication system which allows for interconnection between the different uh, parts of the system. And then from the outside, there will, it, it has the different cyber and physical agents uh, which communicate with um, the, um, the overall Intrepid uh, project, which has the smart navigation, situational awareness modules, the intelligence simplification module, the real time 3D position, the docking models, and also uh, repositories for geodata and other models. All these then are delivered to the end users in different levels uh, through um, smart front ends such as AR glasses or uh, VR glasses or tablets uh, and desktops. So we are able actually to um, build and create um, a whole uh, virtual um, virtual scene of, of the disaster, which changes dynamically. Uh, oh, this is a, a bit more concrete architecture of the system, and uh, I'm just showing this because I want to dive right now to what we are going to create in Interpid called the, the Symbiotic Operation Control Module, which actually combines in a smart manner, different um, agents. So, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, the symbiotic operation module, uh, operation control module, the SOCOM, as we call it, um, is just an enhanced uh, agent that um, delivers more than just its parts. So, in, in a symbiotic way, we can have different uh, agents working together and not in parallel. And as we will explain a bit later on, um, th this whole idea of symbiosis is something that um, changed a lot from a cooperation to something more uh, dynamic. So, symbiotic agents. Uh, the definition is that an agent exists in the same environment, working under similar conditions, but not necessarily doing the same task. So, um, uh, the main idea is how we're going to enhance the possibilities of one agent and to uh, provide a better uh, solution to um, things that, for example, just a drone or just a UGV cannot do. Uh, typical examples that we will see in different use cases will explain how, from a mathematical point of view, actually, um, the different agents share a common uh, optimization function. Uh, to arrive to do so, uh, the first and foremost is that we are able to communicate um, between the different agents. Uh, here, for example, there is an example that um, in a hazardous area, we have UGVs and uh, drones that create their proper trajectory and uh, they find actually a good way, a good way to go from point A to point B with different point A's, but the same point B. And then this information can be shared among the different agents to assist them in creating uh, a better optimal path and to better actually um, uh, make their, uh, um, uh, their overall, optimize actually their overall task. Um, so we're going to see this in different uh, case studies, um, but the first study is the one that we already tested actually from the, um, 
uh, in pilot two is the collaborative scan. So the collaborative scan is the ability of different agents to scan um, the same area on an optimal um, uh, way in order to minimize time, for example. Other examples are to um, minimize the, the burden. For example, uh, there are areas where the drone cannot enter easily, so um, it is a much more harder task for it. And then uh, the drone should, the, uh, the UGV should go there and uh, there is a way to, to do all that by collaborating, uh, by having this collaborative task. Uh, so here it's a, a game of constraints that uh, we are trying to, to minimize. So uh, depends on the proximity of the agent, depends on the different status that we gather from the agents to the um, to the centralized system of it rapid and also the capabilities of the um, of the agents. For example, in order to cover larger areas, we need drones that are capable to go fast. And uh, in order to um, um, scan an area in uh, indoors, we, uh, we need um, uh drones and ugvs that has uh the possibility to um go into narrow areas etc etc so all these are um uh, are part of the uh, intelligence application module which actually takes the decisions to to create that and then are handled from the symbiotic operation control module in the intricate project so but on the higher level is how we combine the different uh, possibilities of each drone based on the constraints to um, that we impose to the task. So another collaborative task is the um, search and assist. So in the search and assist, we have um, one uh, agent that is actually uh, trying to locate uh, the victims. And then actually uh, we have the um, UGVs or other agents that are capable to provide help to uh, assist the um, uh, the victim. Um, there are small agents which are also not very um, very uh, expensive to buy, like small balls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that can uh, there are, there are small robotic um, uh, apparatuses that can work on this uh, context, on, on a collaborative context, and to, to um, assist on uh, enhancing the, um, the assessment capabilities of Intrepid system. So these are things that uh, we want to um, also apply by applying multi-agent systems, like uh, small um, uh, robotic systems that are able to uh, travel uh, in, in very short and narrow places. Uh, and then, you send the big robots capable for doing more than that. And um, here, actually, uh, the symbiosis is hidden under the optimal handling of the um, of the uh, of the situation. So once we have we have been able to find the victim, uh, then we um, found the way to go near it and then also uh, rescue um, and uh, and save a uh, person's life. So uh, the algorithms that are used here are mainly um, optimizations algorithm and also uh, some swarm intelligence. All these are uh, backed uh, by um, uh, reinforcement learning procedure that we are using to train actually um, these um, uh, algorithms. So uh, the evacuation scenario now, it's, uh, it's, um, it's a scenario that we were thinking what will happen if we are in an indoor place and we want to um, evacuate people. So we have robots that are there, um, a fire starts, and then uh, I will just show the, um, the overall idea. So the fire starts, people are starting to run. And so we have different kind of robots, explorers, path cleaners, and guides that are able to um, guide people through safe paths. So this is um, a simulation that um, shows how the um, the symbiosis between different um, robots can can give more to what we already have. So. Um, 
we're not there yet because there are a lot of issues in order to handle this kind of situations. But a, um, uh, the the overall idea is again to have more than just a sum of of, of the parts. Finally, the obstacle uh, movement, something that we um, also do. We have big obstacles that are not able to be moved by one um, agent. So uh, agents are smart enough to um, ask for um, help and the optimal resource uh, station where actually we have a collaboration between UGVs and UAVs where the um, UGV uh, has a charger on top of it and the UAV can land. Uh, I know it's not easy to land that, but um, these are parts of the uh, mechanics of the drones that uh, um, in in, uh, in Interpret project we're working on. So finally, accessibility scenario, robots of new generation should be aware of their limitation, which is something that um, is very, very crucial in order to, to build this symbiotic world. So they need to know how good they are, how um, uh, how their batteries, uh, the whole status, and this should be something that they can communicate to, to the system. So um, also their capabilities, for example, in the accessibility scenario, we have a, a UAV in the indoor scan mission where a closed door cannot um, uh, let him uh, pass. And so it asks for help for the UGV who, who is able to uh, handle the, um, the door and open it so it can continues to um, to do that. Now, on the other hand, you all know that there exist drones that are able to break uh, windows. So uh, again, a UGV in an Indoor Search mission, unable to enter from a window, ask uh, the UEV, which is outside, actually to break in and, um, and actually create a path for it. Uh, now, in order to conclude this whole um, discussion, I just want to leave you with our pilot two video, which is um, um, okay. I will fast forward, but do, do you have sound? Uh, no. No, there's no sound here. No. No. Okay. So um, okay. I don't know how to sell sound right now. Okay. Anyway, this was um, part of the um, of the pilots that we have run in uh, Marseille with different uh, teams uh, working with our agents uh, in in environments that are very very um, difficult to um, assess because of the problems that we have with. Um, uh, video systems, for example, it's very harsh to be able to detect a victim in a smoke environment with an RGB camera. So we have used um, uh, IR cameras for that and our algorithms uh, achieved to to um, to result. Also, we are on board of our, of our on our UAV, we were able to um, uh, to put a, um, a CBRNE detector which actually guided the, um, the other thing. Here you see also fire detection, and uh, this is a complete smoke environment, you see. So um, these are things that we are able to do um, in Interpret project, and um, also the collaboration between uh, cyber and the physical agents is something that's very, very um, uh, in the heart of, uh, of Interpret project. So sorry, you, we don't have the, the sound here. So it's better with the sound. Can I show you? Uh, this is our consortium. So um, this is uh, who we are. And uh, that's all for my part. So if you have any question, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Nicolas. Uh, uh, and again, anything. sorry about my voice. No, no, <laughs> it will be better next time. <laughs> Yeah, let's hope, let's hope, yeah. Um, if there is any question that could be asked in, in the chat, I think you've got a good name for your project. Uh, it, indeed, you. it's an intrepid project uh, with uh, this symbiotic approach. Um, I have just 
one or two questions because um, what struck me, for example, was the image of the robot handling um, an injured person carrying uh, 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 a victim. Um, what are the, because you could see this from a technical point of view, but there are also some ethical issues, I guess. So is it yeah, something that, well, in your project that you are also covering? Um, uh, no, we are not covering that. We are just um, in in, um, in the context of the symbiosis between robots and human operators, and also between robots. Um, we um, we have the ability to integrate whatever exists. So uh, we all know that there exist robots able to do such tasks mm -hmm. to um, assist, for example, and remove a victim from a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, we don't cover that in Intrepid. What we cover is the ability to integrate a new agent into our pro, into our system. So uh, all these um, uh, ethical issues on, on how actually a person, it's not only ethical because we, we had this discussion um, somewhere uh, uh, on a social level, not only an ethical issue, it's how a victim will respond to a robotic savior, it's um, and how this robot should be to do not alarm the, the victim or uh, to 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 build confidence between uh, that and that. So it's there are a lot of questions, also more than, than than the ethical part, which is which is also a big discussion. Okay, thank you, Th thank you. I would like to 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 really thank you all. Um, if there is any final question, please. Uh, ask it now. It's uh, it's time. Uh, just a point of uh, of interest for you. Uh, all the presentation will be made available uh, to all the participants. Um, so you will uh, receive, and everything will be posted on Respond Day website. Uh, so you could uh, look more in detail into the presentations. And of course, if you have some further questions, you can always address them to to, to us. Um, we see that there are a lot of synergy uh, among uh, the different uh, projects we which participated to this webinar um, developing solution addressing issue on order to improve uh, first responder operations um, especially also assessment of the situation um, so hopefully after the end of this project there will be some continuation because that's always a question for the first responder, when will it come into a reality for us? But we see a lot of promising things are very well advanced. And uh, I'm sure that the interest also of the of the user will push for this solution to 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 come to, to the market and be um, uh, in use uh, in in the future by first responder. So I really like, I really want to, to thank you all for, for your participation, for your interest in this webinar. And, um, and please stay uh, tuned with our activities uh, for the final months uh, of the project. So as you saw, many projects will end uh, next year. So there will be also some uh, uh, conclusions and uh, final uh, demo and final product to, to present. Uh, thanks a lot to all of you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.